I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture, we're going to go over the sonographic findings of a DVT. We're going to base the diagnosis of a DVT on the grayscale findings. An acute DVT should result in enlargement of the vein in relationship to the associated artery. The vessel should be non-compressible, and the thrombus, depending on how long it's been there, can be anywhere from acute to hyperechoic. Here you've got a patient with a femoral vein DVT. You can see how much larger the vein is compared to the artery, and you can see that it's filled with echogenic thrombus and it's non-compressible. How much compression do you need to, to do? Well, here's a patient who has a DVT in their common femoral vein. Here you can see the femoral artery, and you can see that with compression, the vein is not compressing, but you can see that the artery itself is tenting. Therefore, there's an adequate amount of compression being performed. Is there enough compression in this case? This is a popliteal vein. So you can see there's the vein, there's the artery. You can see that there's echogenic material within the vein, and what you can see is that uh, as the transducer is, uh, pressure is being applied, you're actually collapsing the artery. So clearly there is more than enough uh, transducer uh, pressure being applied. Now, the echogenicity of a DVT may vary. An anechoic or hypoechoic appearance, like you see here in the right common femoral vein, favors a more acute DVT, but you know, this is not an absolute uh, criteria. Here you've got a patient that has a very hyperechoic thrombus within the uh, lumen. Here's a patient that has a relatively hypoechoic appearing clot within their right common femoral vein. I just want to bring up here one more time about transducer choice. I mentioned in the performance video that you can use either a linear or a curvilinear. In larger patients, you may have to use that curvilinear transducer in order to penetrate to an adequate depth. So the choice of a transducer is really based on the area that you're scanning and how deep you need to penetrate. So while in most cases you're going to use a linear, don't forget in larger patients you're most likely going to have to switch to a curvilinear transducer. Now here's a patient with a common femoral DVT. There's the artery. There's a vein. You can see the saphen is coming in, and you can see that this vein is filled with echogenic thrombus. It's larger than the adjacent femoral artery, and it was non-compressed. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture, we're going to go over the sonographic findings of a DVT. The vein is not compressing, but you can see that the artery itself is tenting. Therefore, there's an adequate amount of compression, but you know, this is not an absolute uh, criteria. Here you've got a patient that has a very hyperechoic thrombus within the uh, yeah. lumen. Here's a patient that has a relatively and how deep you need to penetrate. So while in most cases you're going to use a linear, don't forget in larger patients you're most likely going to have to switch to a curvilinear transducer. Now here's a patient with a common femoral DVT. There's the artery. There's the vein. You can see the saphen is coming in. And you can see that this vein is filled with echogenic thrombus. It's larger than the adjacent femoral artery, and it was non-compressed. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture, here's a patient where the common femoral vein was echogenic thrombus. It's larger than the adjacent femoral artery, and it was non-compressed. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture, here's a patient where the vein, and you can see that this adjacent femoral artery, patient's right, patient's left, you would have nerve, artery, vein, and you can see that this vein is much larger than the adjacent artery. It's filled with hyperechoic thrombus, and it's not compressible. Here's a patient where the 
common femoral vein was then scanned sagittally, and you can get uh, a good look here at the amount of thrombus within the vessel going from anterior, posterior, head and foot. You can see that in this region here, the vessel is completely filled with hyperechoic thrombus. When you find a thrombus in transverse, turn on it sagittally and try and find where the free edge is. Here you can see in this common femoral DVT that the free edge is right at about the level of the insertion of the greater saphenous vein. This can be helpful clinically to know where the free edge of the thrombus is proximally. Here's a sagittal view of the common femoral vein in a patient who had a DVT found on transverse scanning. You can see the artery in the near field. You can see the vein here. You can see the thrombus. Here's the takeoff of the deep femoral artery, but you can see the thrombus within the superficial femoral or the femoral artery. Now here's a patient with uh, femoral vein duplication who has a clot in only one system. Here you can see that the vessel's anechoic. There's some reverberations in there, but the vessel is easily compressible. Here you can see some echogenic thrombus within this system. This was a patient with a chronic DVT, but note how it was only present in one system. So keep that in mind when you're scanning the femoral vein. Here's a patient with a femoral vein DVT. Note that the vein is very echogenic. It almost has the same echogenic uh, appearance as the surrounding tissue. Here's the artery. Note that it's, uh, the artery is much smaller than the vein. And note that uh, the vein is not compressible and that you're starting to tent the artery and there's no collapse of the vein here. So this was a patient with an acute DVT. Here's a patient with a uh, popliteal vein DVT. So posterior, anterior, patient's right, patient's left. Here's the artery. And here's the enlarged vein with hyperechoic thrombus within it. And the vein is non-compressible. Here's a sagittal view of a popliteal vein in a patient with a DVT. Note that the free edge is approximately at about this level here. You don't see any clot up here but you can see that the clot starts right at about this level. So this was a patient with an isolated uh, popliteal DVT. His common femoral and femoral veins were free of any blood clots. Here was a patient who um, presented with isolated calf pain, had a history of cancer. Um, their common femoral vein, femoral vein, and popliteal veins did not reveal presence of a DVT. However, in just scanning distal to that trifurcation of the popliteal vein, it could be seen that there was a very large amount of thrombus within the posterior tibial veins. This patient was subsequently treated as a DVT because of the close uh, proximity of the posterior tibial clot to the insertion into the popliteal vein. What about chronic DVTs? Can you differentiate an acute from a chronic DVT? That is possible, but it can be very difficult. Um, chronic DVTs will usually have a thickened wall. The vein will be of normal or small size, and you may see echogenic thrombus within there, and they may have partial or complete compressibility, and you may notice echogenic web-like filling defects within the vessel. This was a patient who had a prior super, or femoral vein DVT. You can see that the vessel was not dilated. You can see that there's that echogenic web-like filling defects within there and that the vessel was partially compressible. The bottom line here is that it can be extremely difficult to distinguish an acute from a chronic DVT, even in the hands of a skilled physician. Therefore, when you're first learning to perform this, you should uh, choose your patients wisely. You want to avoid scanning somebody who has been treated recently for a DVT and now feels that the symptoms are worsening. Unless you have a prior scan to compare it to, being able to distinguish between acute and chronic can be very difficult, and I would suggest that you not do this during the early phases of your um, uh, scanning careers. So regarding acute from chronic DVTs,
unless you can document that the patient had an interval scan that dem demonstrated complete resolution of the prior clot, just be very careful here. Now here's a patient that has a mobile free edge in an acute DVT. This is not what you would expect in a chronic DVT. And you can see with uh, Valsalva that this is a complete free edge here at risk for embolization. This was a patient with an acute DVT. Now here are sagittal scans of an asymptomatic patient with a known chronic DVT. You can see that there are some echogenic web-like areas in the periphery here, but there's recanalization of the vessel here and that the vessel itself is not enlarged. Here you can see as we follow more distally again there's the echogenic web-like material from the prior clot within there. And you can see that the walls are thickened, but there is recanalization of the lumen. Here's a transverse view of a patient with a known chronic DVT who was asymptomatic. Note that the vessel, the vein here, is not uh, dilated. Note that there's central recanalization, but notice that the walls are thickened, but that the vessel is compressible. This is a patient with a chronic DVT. Here's another patient with a chronic DVT. They were asymptomatic. Note that the vein itself is not enlarged. Note that echogenic web-like material within there and note that for the most part the vein is now compressible. Let's take a look at now at the uh, superficial veins of the legs. The two that you're going to worry about during the focus scan are going to be the greater saphenous vein, which enters into the common femoral vein, and the lesser saphenous vein, which is going to insert into the popliteal vein. Superficial veins will not be accompanied by an artery. Here you can see a clot within the greater saphenous vein. There's no adjacent artery. There's going to be a thin superficial fascial layer surrounding these veins, but not their tributaries. And you have to keep in mind that presence of clot near or at the junction with the deep vein should be treated as a DVT. Here's a patient who presented with unilateral <coughs> left leg swelling. He's got erythema along the course of the greater saphenous vein that goes all the way up near the insertion point into the common femoral vein. And you can see on his a sagittal view of his, greater of his greater saphenous vein that it is completely filled with clot. This was right at the insertion point into the common femoral vein, and he was therefore treated as a DVT. Here's another patient who has a clot within their greater saphenous vein that goes right to the insertion point of the common femoral vein. This is why it's important to obtain this view right here. Here you can see the common femoral vein. It was compressible. But if you watch, there is clot in the greater saphenous vein right at that insertion point. The lesser saphenous vein is going to originate laterally on the dorsum of the foot and ascends the calf posteriorly. The insertion point is going to be variable, but most patient, in most patients it's going to terminate in the popliteal vein at the crease. And here you can see we're following the lesser saphenous vein, and you can see that in this sagittal view that it is completely filled with thrombus. Here's another patient who has clot within the lesser saphenous vein that goes right up to the insertion point into the popliteal. The popliteal vein itself did not have any thrombus, but the fact that the lesser saphenous was completely filled with clot right up to the insertion point led to uh, treating the patient as a uh, DVT. Also advocate that you scan the tender area since frequently you will find the answer. Um, not uncommonly do we find calf uh, or gastrocnemius muscle tears, uh, ruptured Baker's cysts, as well as other pathology when we scan over the tender areas. So do your focus compression ultrasound exam and then scan over the tender area. Here's a patient that came in with right posterior calf pain, looked like he had a DVT, gave a history of some minimal trauma,
But what actually this patient had was a tear of the medial head of his gastroc muscle right by the aponeurosis. And you can see the fluid, and you can see the tear here right at the aponeurosis. So this patient did not have a DVT, but we were able to also then find the etiology of his pain and swelling. Let's now look at some common incidentals. Baker's cysts are going to be synovial cysts. They communicate with the posterior bursa around the knee, and they may mimic DVTs when ruptured. They can appear anechoic or complex. Here you can see the beak or the connection point with the synovium in a sagittal view here of a patient with a Baker cyst. Here you can see a patient we're scanning in the posterior uh, fossa, and you can see the popliteal vein. It's compressible. But then when you scan off to the side here, you can see this curved structure. It's anechoic with the, the tapered neck. This was a patient with a Baker cyst. Again, these are very common, and you're going to frequently run across these when scanning in the uh, popliteal uh, fossa. Now here's a patient with a ruptured Baker cyst. You can see that there's fluid in the subcutaneous tissue here. And this was from a ruptured Baker cyst. Here's the Baker cyst. And then you can see caudal to it. There's all this free fluid tracking. And that was the cause for this patient's calf pain. They did not have a DVT in their common femoral femoral vein or popliteal vein on the focus compression ultrasound. Let's just briefly, before we end the lecture, go through some pitfalls. Since obviously either under or over diagnosing a DVT is uh, potential, uh, causes potential risk to the patient, if you miss the diagnosis of a DVT, remember there's a high rate of pulmonary emboli associated with these uh, um, thrombus, and that is associated with a high morbidity and mortality, overdiagnosing a DVT puts a patient at risk for their treatment with anticoagulation. So let's go through some of the, the key pitfalls. Be careful about using color Doppler and relying on those findings. To diagnose a DVT, you're going to make sure that the vessel is anechoic and that it's compressible. Here you've got a patient that has a large amount of thrombus within the common femoral vein. However, when we went ahead and did a, uh, a transverse scan here, we turned the settings up on the Doppler gain too high, so basically we bled over the thrombus, obscuring it. So be very careful about relying on color Doppler findings as opposed to your grayscale findings. Let's take a look at venous stasis versus clot. Now, we've already mentioned that a normal vein should be anechoic and be compressible, but it's not uncommon in patients with uh, some degree of venous stasis to see echogenic fill-in within the uh, lumen of the vein, but you'll see that these echoes are constantly in motion until you get, in this patient here, you can see that this is venous stasis, the vein is compressible, but as we move down here, now you can see the thrombus, and here is a sagittal view of the vessel. You can see here's thrombus, echogenic fill-in, but you can see even in the patent parts of the vein that there is some spontaneous echo contrast due to venous stasis, but this should not be confused with clot. So let's take a look here. Here you've got a sagittal view here of the common femoral vein, femoral vein, deep femoral vein, and here is the saphenous vein. There's echogenic thrombus within the saphenous vein here. If you take a look at the common femoral vein, the femoral vein, and the deep femoral vein, you can see that there's some echo within there, but this should not be confused with clot. This is just spontaneous echo contrast. You can see that this is constantly moving, and if we were to do compression, these vessels here would be completely compressible. Although this, although this may sound strange, it's possible to confuse an inguinal node as a DVT, especially if you're just doing focused, intermittent, compressive evaluation of the lower extremity veins. Here we put the transducer on in the groin. In the transverse plane, we see this echogenic structure here, which was non-compressible. What you want to avoid is just quickly going, aha, it's a DVT, it's like I thought, 
and then stopping at this point. Remember, when you have an area of concern on transverse, turn sagittal to confirm that it's a vessel and to look for the free edge. Remember, an inguinal node won't be paired with an artery and it's going to be of a fixed AP length. And that's what you notice here. Here are the vessels down here, but here's a patient with multiple enlarged inguinal nodes. So just be careful of that. This concludes the sonographic findings of a DVT video. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture we're going to go over the sonographic liquid amount of compression being performed, either a linear or a curve. Well, in most cases, you're going to use larger than the adjacent larger patients. You're most likely going to have to switch. Now, here's a patient with a common femoral DVT. There's the artery. There's the vein. You can see the saphen is coming in, and you can see that this vein is filled with echogenic thrombus. It's larger than the adjacent femoral artery and it was non-compressed. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and this is the Clinical Applications Lecture for the Focus Lower Extremity Compression Ultrasound Module. Let's review some of the key points. Remember, focus study does not rule out isolated calf DVTs. In patients that you feel are at uh, medium to high risk, since there's a 20 to 30 percent propagation of isolated calf DVTs, these patient, patients need serial exams, usually in about three to four days, to relook at the calf veins, usually from, again, the groin down to the popliteal vein. Bilateral studies are only going to be indicated if the patient is symptomatic in both legs or if you find thrombus in one leg that extends proximally into the groin and you're unable to find the free edge. Augmentation is not part of our focused study. Color Doppler interrogation is not part of the study either and if you do use it you have to be careful and not abandon your grayscale findings in favor of color Doppler findings. If you do use a three-point exam remember that focus or focal thrombus can be missed. In terms of pitfalls remember duplication is common in the superficial femoral veins and the popliteal veins and it can be easy to miss a DVT isolated to one of these systems. So when you get to the level of the femoral vein and the popliteal vein, stop and look to see if duplication is present. Remember, color Doppler can bleed over a clot and lead to a false negative exam, and differentiating an acute from a chronic DVT may be difficult. If you've got someone who's had a prior DVT, look in the records. If they've had an interval ultrasound that showed complete resolution of the clot, then your interpretation should be relatively straightforward. However, if an interval ultrasound showed presence of residual clot, this may not be a good focus study for you to perform. And lastly, remember, if you see an abnormality in the transverse plane, turn on it sagittally. This may help you to find the free edge, and it may also help you to avoid calling something such as an enlarged inguinal lymph node as being a DVT. This now com concludes the clinical application video in the lower extremity compression ultrasound series.